Hello, welcome to New Mercistical. We are continuing our series on baseball game prediction. We are now in our sixth video. In the last video, we showed how to scrape pitching data so that we could have data on the individual starting pitchers and add those to our model. And so in this video, we're going to go ahead, take those features that we derived last time, add them into our model, and see how much of an impact it has. And along the way, we'll, we'll also discuss how to sort of quantify the impact of different different features in your model and how to know if you're really improving the model or is it just random noise. With that said, uh, before we get into the notebook, I'd like to again ask you to please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out a lot. Okay, so as I said before, in the last notebook, we augmented our data frame to include various features based on the starting pitcher's performance. And now we're going to add in these features, see how much improvement we get to our model. What one note I want to make is I, I modified the notebook uh, that I showed in the last lesson a little bit. Uh, the main thing is I, I wanted to add STRT starter to the future names. I will upload uh, the modified notebook so that you can have, if you're following along at home, you can have the actual, uh, the same exact experience that, that I'm having here. Um, but just wanted to let you know about that. Um, so with that, let's get started. Let's jump into the notebook. We're reading the data frame that we created in the last notebook. Again, has, my version will have these slight modifications. Um, and again, we're going to set our training set to be everything since 1980 up to 2018. Uh, choose 2019 to be our 2019 and 2020 to be our validation set to tell us when to stop early, and we'll evaluate our model <coughs> on. Uh, the 2021 and 2022 seasons. So for our first model, if you remember our naive model that we're, we're starting with and that we're now going to see how much more we're going to improve, just had these two very simple features, the on-base percentage and the slugging uh, for the home and the visiting teams. So as a simple starting point, let's just look at the ERA and the WHIP, so walks, hits over innings pitched and the earn run average of the starting pitcher over the last 35 games, and this was a feature we developed in the lesson last time. Let's add those into our model, see how much it improves, and, and try to get a sense of, of where we're at relative to approaching the Las Vegas model. That's sort of our, our gold standard that we're trying to match or exceed. So we create our train validation test sets. You'll see we have 85,000 almost 86,000 games to train on, 3,300 that we're using for validation, and uh, 4,800 for testing. So we'll, again, just do the same light GBM model we did before with early stopping. And if you take a look now, you'll see our, the, the naive model, where you, all you know is just the mean, gives 0.6905 for the log loss. Our previous model gave 0.6830, so that was adding just, just the on-base and the, sl and the slugging for the home and visiting teams. So you see now we get 0.6747. So that's a pretty, pretty significant improvement. Let's, let's try to quantify that uh, with respect to the Las Vegas odds. So Las Vegas odds, if you remember, is 0.6675. Um, so let's let's try to put these numbers in perspective. So I've put this is and let's give a little bit of language around this. So to talk about this, I think it's useful to come up with a notion of uh, basis points. So we're going to define a basis point to be 0. 0.0001 in log loss. This way, instead of talking these decimals, we can kind of talk in, in integral numbers. So we had. Our naive model gives 0.6904. The Las Vegas model gives 0.6675. So I'm going to see how many basis point improvement the Las Vegas is from the naive. I'm going to see how many basis points our naive model, uh, or our simple model, I should say, where we just had the hitting statistics, the team hitting statistics, how many basis points improvement that was, and how many basis point improvement this current model where we added in starting pitching gives us. So you can see that. Uh, the Las Vegas model is 229 basis points improvement from the starting point. The starting point being 
all we know is that the home team wins like 53.8% of the time, so we just guess 53.8 every single time. Now, our previous model was 74 basis points improvement, so we, we kind of said before that was about a third of the way from the starting point of a completely naive model to the Las Vegas odds. And you'll see our current model now gives 157 points improvement. So it's kind of like adding in those first hitting statistics took us about a third of the way there, and now adding in the starting pitching has taken us another third of the way there. So that's a good way to think about this. And uh, later on in this video, we're going to dive more into analyzing the log loss and talking about like how many basis points of improvement is really meaningful when we start playing around with different features. So that's something we'll get to later in this lesson. And if you're interested, I actually have a video, and I'll put a link to it on the screen now, um, where I really go in depth into the log loss and do the connections to information theory. So if you're interested in that, you should you should check out that video. Um, but I'll give a, a say a few things here, which is that the log loss is can be thought of as entropy. So if you think about it in the context of this problem, the the log loss of the completely naive model, where I just guess 53.8 percent for every for every game. That's the entropy of Y in this case, the unconditional entropy of Y. And now when I add in those two uh, hitting things, the on-base percentage and the slugging, I'm now saying, okay, what's the entropy conditional on the team hitting performance? And the entropy goes, goes down a little bit. And then I'm gonna do what's the entropy with respect to those hitting features plus the starting pitching features, and it goes down further. So that's one way to put this in perspective is, is how much can we reduce the entropy as as we get more features as we're conditioning and more different things incorporating into the model okay but let's get fo go keep going forward and let's uh let's look at some ice plots for these so you see again the hittings it makes sense as the home team has a higher on-base percentage, uh, the home team is more likely to win. As the visiting team has a higher on-base percentage, uh, the home team is more likely to lose. Uh, same pattern with slugging. Now let's look at ERA. As the ERA of the home team gets higher, they're more likely to win. So that means that as the pitcher gets worse, the home pitcher gets worse, the home team is less likely to win. As the visiting pitcher gets worse, the home time team is more likely to win. That all makes sense. And it's the same pattern for walks, hits over innings pitch. So we have some consistency there. That, that all makes sense. Let's look at the reliability diagram just to see if our model is well calibrated. And again, all the points seem to be within the, the, the error bounds, so it looks pretty good. You'll see we get, uh, again, a little more spread on, on this right-hand histogram. We've been looking at these ice plots to kind of judge how, how the, the, the impact of these features. But if we want something a little more quantitative to, to say, you know, which variables are influencing this model the most, uh, one thing you can use is what are called chat values. And I'm not gonna go too much into detail on these, maybe I will in another video. So let's, let's look at some of these. I'm gonna compute these chat values. I'm gonna look at them. So if you, if you look, you'll see the intercept is 0.157. And, and the way to interpret that is on the log odds scale, we're starting at 0.157. So log odds of zero would mean that it's a 50-50 uh, prediction for home versus away. 0.157 is probably right at that 53.8% level, meaning that we're slightly favoring the home team. And then what we see is that each, each row here is a particular game. So for the top game, you see that when, when it saw the home team's on-base percentage, uh, we got a negative 0 0.079. So it means that when it saw that, the, the on-base percentage of the home team, it thought, oh, now that I know that, the home team's a little bit less likely to win. And then when it saw the same thing for the visiting team, it said, ah, oh, now I think the home team's a little bit more likely to win. And it breaks it down into these components. And this is really useful because for a particular prediction, you can now say, 
how did you get there? You start at this intercept, and then you add up all these adjustments for the different features, and that's how you get to the final prediction. So to, to see if this makes sense, you know, one thing we could do, so the biggest number here seems to be this one right here uh, in these few examples. In this, this bottom game in, of these five, we see that the starting whip 35 for the visiting team. So when it saw this visiting team's starting pitcher's whip, it said, wow, the home team's less likely to win now, now that I know that. So let's just look at who, who was that pitcher. And it was Kenta Maeda. And uh, if you look at this, this is the beginning of our test set. Our test set started in 2021. And, you know, Kenta Maeda had a great season in the in the, the shortened 2020 season. I think he came in second in the Cy Young voting. So that kind of makes sense when so oh Kenta Maeda starting the game for the for the visitors team. Okay, now I think the visiting team's like considerably more likely to win. Another thing we could do with these values, so these values are useful for sort of breaking down individual predictions. But another thing you could do with them is you could take their absolute values and average them. And then you're getting a sense of, on average, how much does this feature influence my prediction? Either way, either making it more likely for the home team to win or the, more likely for the visiting team to win. So you take the absolute value to just get the magnitude of the effect. And then you average across all the observations. And if this number is high, it means that this variable, this feature tends to be very influential in my predictions. And if it's low, it means like this thing usually, you know, makes a tiny little adjustment one way or the other, but it's not that influential. <clears throat> so I'm sorting these from the most significant to the least significant. So we can ignore the intercept for now. Um, so this is finding that in our current model, the, the whip of the starting pitcher is the most important thing, then the on-base percentage, then kind of, and here you get a little bit of noise, so for some reason it's finding the home team's ERA to be slightly more than the, the visiting team's ERA, right? that's probably just noise from a limited data set. But essentially these last two are kind of about tied, the, the starter's ERA and the slugging. So that's sort of interesting, whoops. And uh, I think what you'll find with ERA and a lot of, you know, saber metrics nerds have, have come to this conclusion also, ERA is actually not that great of a measure of, of a pitcher's performance. And I think there are a few reasons for that. One is just uh, the judgment of what's an earned run or not is a little bit, uh, can be a little bit subjective. Sometimes things can count as earned runs um, that shouldn't and vice versa. Sometimes you have one error and the pitcher pitch is terrible and they all count as unearned runs, even though like the pitcher was still pitching pretty badly. Another reason why ERA is probably not a great statistic is it's, it's very downstream. It's a little bit too far downstream from the pitcher's actual uh, impact. So one model of the game is to just say every pitch, every time a pitcher faces a batter, you know, there's some probability distribution on all the different things that could happen in that at bat. And then it happens and then the next at bat happens. And it's a different pitcher, uh, same pitcher, different hitter, and you go on and go forward. So, if if the pitcher is, has really good percentages on, in how they, in how what happens to each batter, that should flow downstream into how many runs get scored against them, right? So if if they're giving up very few hits and walks, very few extra base hits, striking out a lot of people, that should then flow down and 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 affect how many runs or earned runs get, get given up. Now, what would it mean if they are, you know, two pitchers and one's better at their statistics against the hitters and the other one is getting fewer earned runs? It could mean one of two things. It could mean that either, um, you know, it's just noise like one pitcher's getting lucky, they're giving up more hits and walks, but they're not scoring because the timing of, of when they're getting those hits is not working out to their advantage. Or it could be that, you know, the pitcher, this pitcher really can turn it up a notch. So they might give up some walks and hits, but when the bases are loaded, they really turn it up a notch and, and get the strikeout when they need to. 
Um, and, and while the second is, is uh, compelling from a storytelling point of view, I think there has not been a lot of evidence to suggest that this is the case or that this is an important effect. And so I think it tends to be more effective to just model things as, as sort of each independent trial. And uh, I think there's been some, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, this is just kind of from what I've thought about and what, what I've read. So I'd be interested to hear if anyone knows of any, any information to the opposite. But the idea I'm getting at is in general, you want your features to have the least noise possible in what you're trying to measure or assess the impact of. So I think the statistics about what happens, the outcome of each batter versus what's the sort of averaging out and simulation of a whole inning, which has a lot of noise in terms of, oh, I gave up a hit when there was two outs versus no outs. And then there was, you know, the home run happened before the hit or after the hit makes a big difference in the number of runs, even if, you know, uh, the, the performance from the hits and walks point of view is not quite as uh, different. So anyway, just throwing that out there to say that it's not too surprising to me that ERA is not that great of a feature. And let, let, let's let's keep going and, and, and see, see whether that bears to be true. <coughs> so next I'm going to add in a, a few more starting pitcher features. So let's go through what these are. The strikeout percentage. So this is in terms of batter's face. So I'm I'm a pitcher. I am facing a batter. What's the probability I get a strikeout? So it's 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 the number of strikeouts of the pitcher per batter faced. So it's a little different than strikeouts per innings pitched, right? Because strikeouts per innings pitched, you could you could strike out the side three straight strikeouts, um, or you could have three strikeouts, but with five home runs in the middle of the inning too. And those would both give you three strikeouts per innings pitched, right? But clearly the first is much better than the second. So that's why, again, I like to focus on uh, statistics per batter face rather than per innings pitch, because I think they're a little less noisy. So along these lines, I came up with something that's essentially like opposing slugging um, or, or opposing on base plus slugging. So, so if you're a baseball stats nerd, you've come across you know a really well used statistic is on base percentage plus slugging percentage. Um, but if you break that down mathematically, it's a little bit weird if you actually look at what that looks like as a fraction. And it seems to me a more consistent fraction would be to say what's the sort of average number of bases per batter faced. So, somebody's at the plate. Kind of a hit counts as one base, a walk also counts as one base, double two, triple three, home run four. On average, how many bases do I give up per batter faced? On base plus slugging approximates that. There's probably not that much of a practical difference, but to me, this is a little bit more precise. So I, I, I decided to, to use that as a feature where I say exactly what I just described. So it's you could think about this as essentially slugging on base plus slugging against. And this is just, again, hit and walk percentage. This is sort of like on base percentage against for the starter. So let's see what happens when I add in these additional pitching base features into the model. And you see, from a log loss point of view, we didn't really change much. We had six, seven, four, seven. We actually got a little bit worse, six, seven, four, nine, eight. So about six, seven, five, oh. If we're going to round to four decimal places. So it went up by about two or three basis points worse. And we're going to get into a little later, like, how much stock should I put into that? Did I really make the model worse? Is that just noise? And, and how, to, how to address that? But let's meanwhile look at, look at, uh, what came out of this model, so we'll do the ice plots. So you see a few interesting things here. Um, one is that if you look at the starter's ERA just from the ice plots, when you see ice plots that are almost essentially a straight line, that means the model is not changing its prediction very much with respect to this, this uh, feature. 
So it means that feature is not so important. But it was important in the previous one. But what we seem to be seeing is that um, now, given some of these other pitching features that we add in, it's looking less at ERA. So if ERA is all you have, it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, indicator of pitcher quality. But when you have some of these other features that are a little bit more precise, it starts not looking at ERA quite as much. So, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, now, let's see if that bears out when we start averaging these shot values. So, so now that we've added in more features, it's interesting. Actually, the strikeout percentage over the last 35 games is the most important feature. That it, that's what the model thinks is the most important feature. Um, and you see the ERA kind of goes to the bottom. And then we have the 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 sort of opposing slugging is kind of it's kind of a split decision depending on visiting and home and again we wouldn't really expect these things to be too different for visiting and home so this is probably indicating that um, you know there, there's just some sort of noise essentially in, in the calculation of these things but you see for the most part they group together right the, the strikeout percentages are together. The on-base percentages are together. The starters' whips are together. The sluggings are pretty close, and so forth. But uh, again, the, the take-home here seems to be that the strikeout percentage is, is maybe a little surprisingly strong, and maybe unsurprisingly, the ERA is not so important once we uh, once we incorporate some of these other features. Now let's go further. Now I've just been using over the past 35 games so far. So remember when we developed these features, we're doing a look back for the starter on their past N games. And we picked a couple different values. So we picked 10 and 35. And I later added in, uh, I think, one or two more window sizes. But um, I've been focusing on 35. I figured like 35 staff starts per year. It's kind of a good number to, to average over. But Let's also now throw in the ones based on 10, so a smaller window. Maybe this will be uh, add in other contexts. Maybe pitcher's hot lately. Maybe they do better at different parts of the season. Maybe we'll capture some effects there. So let's see if that bears out. So I'm going to take the same, again, just the same two hitting statistics. I'm not changing that so far in this model. And now I'm uh, throwing in, I took out the opposing on base percentage, and I'm just doing ERA, whip, strikeout percentage, and this sort of opposing slugging, and uh, putting in both the 35 game look back and the 10 game look back. So let's see what happens here. So 6, 7, 4, 8, again, not much change overall in its final performance. Let's look at the uh, the ice plots. And uh, you know, we could we could start decomposing these, but it's probably easier to just look at those shot values because it's a little bit more numeric. So what do we see here? Now that I've put in more pitching things, well one thing is that the pitching stats now start getting a little bit diluted, right? Because when you have redundant features, when you have features that are exactly redundant, the shot values are basically going to get divided by two for each of them. Um, so if they're not exactly redundant, but they're pretty close, it's going to start kind of splitting some of the value of that across the two. So, but the interesting thing that comes out here is actually it's finding that for strikeout percentage, it's finding the 10 game look back a little bit more impactful than the 35 game look back. Whereas for the other ones, it finds the 35 game look back to be more important. So this is going to be a big piece of our modeling actually that, that we're not getting to right now, but maybe later when we're really trying to squeeze the last few drops of signal out of our model. One of the things we'll probably want to play with is what are the right look backs? Do I want just one look back? Do I want multiple look backs? What, what sizes of these look backs should I be doing? Should I be looking at two years of history, five years of history? Or should I be looking at very small? Are there some features where the very recent performance in the last few games is actually indicative? So these are questions we don't know the answer to, and the only way to get them is to sort of do some of this exploration.
Um, so this is a process I like to go through in a modeling. It's just like start getting a sense of these these features, what's important, which you know, uh, which look back sizes seem to be impressive or not. So you know, if you put in something with like a two game look back, you'd probably see yeah, it doesn't really have much of an effect. So you know, okay, I don't have to bother with that anymore. Um, so we could iterate on this a lot. I'm just going to do one more model where I basically, I pick just the whip 35. Um, so this one, this, the strikeout percentage of 10 and the, uh, the total base is the sort of opposing slugging for 35. So I just picked out, um, just again, trying to be sort of a little more parsimonious and sort of noticing that the strikeout percentage seems to be more impactful with just that 10 game look back. <coughs> let's, let's see where this takes us. So again, 0.675, again, not much of a change. It's not, certainly not any better. It's a few basis points worse than our first model so far. In fact, the very first model that just had ERA and WHIP is doing the best, even though ERA was kind of, seemed to be later shown that it, it's not so impactful. So we can go through this again and see what happened with the shot values. And uh, you see here again, sort of nothing changed too much. The strikeout percentage for 10 is the highest now because we got rid of the, the 35. So now everything's focused on just the 10. Um, the whip is still there. The slugging is, you know, sort of near the bottom, but still impactful, 0 0.04, 0 0.03. Um, but now the, the, the big question is, as, as you're going through this, you're like, how much does this, how much difference does this make? Particularly with regards to the loss, the log loss value. So I'm adjusting the features. My log loss is changing a little bit up and down. How do I know, is that is that meaningful? Or is that just like complete noise that I should just be ignoring? Um, so more broadly, like when a model A does better, does a few basis points better than a model B in log loss, how should we think about that? Is it meaningful? Is it luck of the draw of the test set? So one way to get at this is to do some simulations. So I wrote a quick little function over here that will simulate a scenario. And what it's going to do is the following. It's going to say, let's say I know the true probabilities of a bunch of these games. And again, these games are like coin flips. So imagine I get a bunch of coins, they have a true bias, and let's say this probact true represents sort of the true bias of each of these coins. And then I've got one model, which is like a set of predicted probabilities for the same coin. So I have some process that's trying to say which of the, what's the probabilities on these coins, on these games. And I've got a second model that's a, a different model on the same set of games. And the question I'm trying to get at is, if model one is a little bit better than model two, how much of an improvement in log loss should I expect for a particular test set? So to apply that to this game, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume that the, the Las Vegas probabilities are kind of the right probabilities. So I have the right probabilities given by Las Vegas. Let's assume that that's like descended from heaven. Those are the right probabilities, can't do any better. I'm gonna flip a bunch of coins based on those probabilities. And I'm gonna look at two different models and score the models for each particular set of coin flips uh, that I did. But I'm gonna repeat this process multiple times and see in the law and, and get a distribution of how often did model one get a better log loss than model two? How often did model two actually get a better log loss than model one? And in this case, I'm trying to simulate two models where model one is definitely a little bit better than model two. So I take the true probabilities and I add in a little bit of noise, uniform noise. And in one case for model one, it's plus or minus uh, 2% uniformly. So the true probability is 58%. Model one is gonna randomly pick a number between 56% and 60% and use that as its probability. And model two is not quite as good, so it's got a bigger range. It's plus or minus 4%. So it seems like it should be a somewhat significant difference. I mean, certainly you'd 
be a lot happier if you could cut your noise in half. But now let's see, oh, whoops, I forgot to run the function. Let's see, and this takes a while because I'm going to have it do 10,000 simulations um, of how this plays out. <clears throat> and so this is the plot of the discrepancies. So we've got zero over here. Uh, and to the left of zero means that model one did better than model two. We're taking the log loss of model one minus the log loss of model two, lower log loss is better. So everything to the left of zero are observations where uh, model one, the, the better model, did in fact do better on long loss. And everything to the right of zero is where actually model two looked like it was better based on log loss. So you see there's a pretty significant probability in this case that on a, we're only observing one trial. Remember when I, when we do these, these uh, samples, when we do this feature testing, we're only observing one element of this bell curve, of this curve is the way to think about it. And so there's a pretty good chance that we just might even, you know, one model might look better, even though it's actually worse. It might do better on a particular instance. And now what, what impacts this? There are a couple things that impact this. One is how much improvement actually is model one versus model two. So if you look at this curve, you see that the improvement is probably like around, I don't know, seven or eight basis points, right? So this negative 0.001, that's 10 basis points improvement. So this on average is doing less than that, it looks like. It looks like it's doing about eight, seven, eight. And you see the, the variance around that is, is significant. Now the variance around that is based on the size of the test set, right? So because we only have, I think we have like three or 4,000 points in our test set, which is not huge. So because the test set is fairly small, it means that even if I have a better model, I make it, I add some features or I change my features so that I have a better model, there's a good chance it might show little to no improvement or it might even be worse. So let's, let's, to demonstrate the impact of the size of the test set, I'm gonna imagine, let's say my test set was 10 times as big. So I basically just duplicate my test set 10 times and repeat this. So instead of having three or 4,000 in my test set, I'm gonna have like 30 or 40,000 in my test set with the same sort of repeated probabilities over and over again. And let's see what happens when we run that. Okay, so it finished the simulation and what we see is Okay, so again, on average, the improvement is about eight basis points. So that's kind of what we thought. So the sort of true improvement of model one versus model two is about eight basis points. So, so the first thing to, to point out is that that doesn't seem that big, eight basis points, but it's actually could be meaningful, right? Uh, Changing your error from plus or minus 4%, plus or minus 2% gives you about eight basis points of improvement. So that's, that's just an interesting way to try to calibrate what log loss means. The second thing is that now that we've got 30, 40,000 or so in our test set, the plus or minus is a lot smaller. So it's very unlikely now with this big test set of 30, 40,000 that we would see model two doing better than model one. Um, so this is an argument perhaps to that we should be using a, a bigger test set. Now there are other problems with that, that that might get in the way, but this shows the value of having a big test set. If you have a big test set, you, you could you can isolate these small improvements a lot better than when you have a smaller test set. Now another demonstration is let let's say the the impact of the model improvement. We'll go back to our small test set but will make the impact a lot bigger. So one, model one is still plus or minus 2%, but model two is, is much worse. It's plus or minus 10%. Um, so let's run that and see what that one looks like. Okay, so what do we see here? We see again, now the impact is about 70 basis points. So it's a much bigger impact. And now because of that also, you're still much more likely uh, or very unlikely 
to see model two doing better than model one, even on the small data set of three or 4,000. So you're balancing a few things here. It's like, what's actually the magnitude of your improvement and what's the size of the test set? And then that will tell you how, how likely it is, um, you know, how much stock you could put on to when, when your log loss goes up or down, whether it's meaningful or not. So the, the conclusions that I think about from this is that, you know, it could be that even a five or 10 basis point improvement is meaningful. So again, eight basis points in this case was the difference between plus or minus 2% on the probability and plus or minus 4% on the probability. Um, the variation due to test set size is considerable. So because we're only working with three or, three or 4,000 in our test set, um, you know, we, we could have, um, you know, a big variation. So even if we're doing the model that's truly eight basis points better, the plus or minus is such that we might actually show it doing worse. Um, now for this problem, it's not a simple matter to increase the test set size, right? Because it's chronological. We kind of want to measure the effect of, you know, training on the early stuff and, and testing on the later stuff. Um, so we could in increase the test set by going back in time. Now we're also including some of the, the COVID season stuff, which, you know, might impact the model. Um, so it's something we could consider and, and something we should think through. But um, it's not, not quite so simple a matter in this problem to just increase the test set size. Um, but in terms of going back to feature selection and what this means, it doesn't seem to be a huge difference between these different feature sets we're trying. And, and I think the take home is, you know, hitting those, those first hitting statistics got us a third of the way from the nothing model to the Las Vegas model. Starting pitching is taking, about an, taking us about another third of the way. You know, tweaking those features probably is not going to, you know, trying to optimize which set of features is exactly the best. It's probably not going to get us that far because we've tried a few combinations that don't seem to be moving the needle very much. So certainly if, to approach Vegas, we're going to need to to meaningfully improve our model, add more features, and add, add uh, you know, add things that are going to have a bigger impact than just sort of feature selection or hyperparameter optimization. Um, to note also uh, offline, I, I tried it. I played around with different max depths in the model to see if oh now that I've got more features, should I have a, a bigger max depth? That's often that's the most influential feature typically in boosting models. Once you once you start using early stopping, so that you're not worried about the the uh, learning rate or the number of trees, the, the most important thing then is the max depth. So I tried hiking up the max depth to three or four and it generally you know, got a little bit worse. So, uh, you know, I don't think any amount of optimization on the features we have now is going to get us close to Las Vegas model. And that makes sense. We should, there's still a lot of things we're not considering. So let's think about uh, what should be our next steps. So one is that we have nothing about the quality of the bullpen. So the bullpen for baseball newbies, you have the starting pitchers, and then you have what's called the bullpen, which are the, the set of relief pitchers. And the bullpen is important, and in particular, in recent years, it's become more and more important. And, and uh, this is that starting pitchers uh, pitch for a lot fewer innings than they used to. So I think it's around 2014 or so, and we can look at this, but around 2014, they started um, paying more attention to pitch counts and really taking pitchers out when they reached a certain pitch count. So it used to be you put a pitcher in and you would just let that pitcher go as long as they could. And if they were pitching fine, you, you let them finish the whole game. And that does not happen as much anymore. Now it's frequently, you know, five, six innings. Six innings is considered probably a, a longish start these days. So, what does that mean? That means that the bullpen is more meaningful now than it might have been in the past. In the past, if you had an ace starter, you could be very confident that that pitcher would pitch seven, eight, nine innings, and you wouldn't even need the bullpen, or if you needed them, it would be for just a few outs. But the way they play the game today, even when you've got an ace pitcher, you're still going to have to go to the bullpen. So if you have an ace pitcher and a poor bullpen, that might impact you a lot more. And, and this is one issue of something that's called model drift, which is something we'll explore in a lot of ways. But 
this happens when you're dealing with real world data that models the, the reality changes over time. The, the theoretical machine learning setup is assuming that whatever generated your data set is sort of constant. It's a constant distribution and it generated all your data. And they don't account for the fact that that data generating machine might change a little bit over time. And so the data in the past might not come from the exact same distribution. And that's a really interesting issue. It's, a, it's, it's a, interesting in lots of respects. But it's something we'll have to explore. Uh, our games, I, I use data starting at 1980. It might be that, that if the game has changed so much that data from the 1980s might be so irrelevant, it might be worth it to just leave it out, right? Or consequently, or conversely, it could be that, yeah, the game changed a little bit, but it's in, the, in terms of the fundamentals, it didn't change that much. In fact, we should go back further in time and get more data, even if it might seem a little bit less relevant. So trading off those things of having more data, but which might be from a slightly different distribution than what we're trying to predict, that's a really common trade-off that you have to assess in these situations. Going forward with next steps, though, how can we improve this model? Uh, another thing we, we should think about is that we, we're not accounting for the specific hitting lineup. Right now, we, uh, we're looking at the team, the average team hitting performance. But, you know, if you've got a superstar hitter and you're resting him that day, that should clearly impact, uh, impact your, the team's probability of winning if their star hitter is, is taking a day off or is, is hurt. So <clears throat> that's something else we'll probably want to address in this model to improve it, given that, you know, we still seem to have a... a a, a bit more to go to get close to the Las Vegas probabilities. Um, now to do that, we'd need the individual batter data. So we'd have to scrape that data, similar to how we scraped the pitching data. Um, another thing is that we have nothing right now about fielding. And again, uh, baseball sabermetrics nerds will tell you that, um, you know, fielding's a very sort of underappreciated aspect of the game. Fielding makes a huge difference. If you get it, if you, you know, turn a hit into an out that could have a a huge impact um, on the game. So uh, we'll try to think about how we can measure feeling. One of the reasons why feeling is underappreciated is because there aren't good metrics for it. The, 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 the key metric that was used you know, historically was feeling percentage. Did you make an error or not? But it doesn't really tell you about your range, for example, for an infielder, how far are you, are you getting to balls that other people wouldn't get? Um, so there, there are some Adva more advanced metrics now, and so we'll have to do some work and do some sleuthing to try to figure out how we can incorporate those into the model. Uh, then finally, another thing I want to talk about is uh, um, there's a lot of other sources of model drift besides what I was talking about with the, uh, the starting pitchers working fewer innings, right? So there's this uh, this infield shift. So the infield shift became a thing where where teams started using data to say where they should place their infielders and to sometimes to quite extreme uh, quite extremes like putting three of the infielders on, on one side of a base on one, one side of second base and now there's a rule change that they actually took away that capability you have to have two infielders on each side of second base that just started this year so as we go to make predictions we have to realize again it's a slightly different game now than what we learned about before uh, the pitching clock has come in so we're, we're going to see the impacts of that um, and, you know, the NL National League now has a DH. I believe this started a year or two ago. But that's another uh, important factor is that we've trained on all these games where the pitchers were hitting, and now there will be no games where the pitcher is hitting. So how is that going to affect our model? So, so that's all I have for this. Um, Going forward now, what are we going to do next? I think the next thing I want to do for this model is to try to use the bullpen, try to get something about the quality of the bullpen. And that's going to be a little tricky because you don't know, if you were to build a really complicated bullpen model, you'd want to know first the quality of all the individual pictures in the bullpen, and then also who's available, who's pitched recently, who's on is tired, who's likely to come into the game, and so forth. That, um, and we could do that, but to start with that, I'm gonna do something a little simpler, which is basically just say, 
have a team bullpen statistic where I say, here's the performance. I know the performance of the team, and I know the performance of the starter. If I subtract out the starter from, from the team, what remains is what the bullpen did. So I'm going to use that and aggregate that over games to, to get some basic bullpen stats. Um, so that's, what's, that's what you'll have to look forward to in the, in the next videos. We're going to process the data to get features about the bullpen, and then we'll add in the bullpen data to the model and see how much uh, improvement we have. So those will be probably our next two videos. Um, so thank you again for joining me. Uh, again, if you could like this video and subscribe to the channel, it would really help me a lot. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me today, and I'm hoping to get a few more videos out in quick succession. I know the season's starting. I was hoping to be further along with this model by the time the season started. Um, looks like I'm going to have to be, you know, a few weeks into the season before I really have this model up and ready to go. But I hope you'll join me for this journey and, and continue along, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.